Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through View 571. Today we're going to take a look at Gangs of Kimura. Now this is a brand new game that's just coming out now from Games Workshop. And it takes place in the Dark Elder City of Kimura. And it's a two-player game. Each player will take on the side of either Hellions or Reavers. And, but you can also mix them if you want. And those are two different gangs. And you'll kind of divide your gang up into these things called murder packs. So you'll send out a little squad of bikers and riders. And you'll go out and kind of complete a different scenarios. Now you can play it over a campaign. So you kind of randomly generate some of the conditions and the setup. And sort of like the prequels to the scenarios. Uh, similar to a game like Necromunda or something like that. And you go out and you just try to blast each other out of the sky. Uh, and then over the course of the campaign, if you choose to play a campaign, you'll level up uh, your riders and you'll get, be able to buy new equipment for your bikes and make these deals and things. Uh, so let's jump in and take a look at how the mechanics of the game work and then I will tell you what I think of it. So I've kind of set up some riders out here in sort of a pseudo scenario. The game does come with its own terrain. It gives you these cardboard spires. It gives you six of these and I have played with these. Uh, they are about the right size of terrain I think that you want for this game. You don't want big bulky terrain like this, but you could experiment with it, which I have. Uh, you need to be careful because when you fly into terrain, there's a decent chance that you're just going to die. And much of what kind of dictates the game is these maneuver abilities that you can take. And frankly, my only kind of component gripe with the game is these are fine for kind of getting set up and learning the game, but there's not really any variety or anything uh, to them, and they kind of sit in a weird spot. But the theme of the game does take place kind of in the skies or the upper levels of a Kimura. So you're kind of flying around these, you know, skyscrapers and trying to take each other out. And the game does suggest uh, three foot by three foot at least, and I would definitely recommend that. You could probably scale it up to four foot by four foot, is, especially if you kind of gear up for larger battles. And it comes with two types of figures here. So you have these Reavers here. Uh, so these guys are on these jet bikes here, and there's various different, uh, you know, variations on the model. I kind of apologize for this paint job. It's a little bit quick and dirty, but I wanted to kind of get it painted up into the table. Now, my favorite are these Hellions here. Here's my favorite model, I think. And this gal here, she looks pretty cool. And these guys kind of ride, you know, they have these, uh, oh, some of them have like a little chain, which kind of chains them to uh, these hovercraft here. And they have these melee weapons and things that they can use. Uh, so these are really interesting models to put together and paint. Here and these are somewhat older uh, models, so you're going to get like two kits of the Hellions and you get two kits of the Reavers uh, with that. That you can also buy extra from Games Workshop, and it comes with the assembly guide. I do kind of miss. Uh, I would just kind of caution if you're kind of a new miniature player. Uh, these are fine. They show you all the pieces, but they don't really give you quite the step by step. Uh, that you might want, but they're certainly easy enough to kind of figure out what goes where. And once you build one of each of the types, you're good to go. I will say it also comes with these very nice uh, quick reference cards. They're double sided. And so you can give each player that. And really the rules of the game are just baked right into this. Uh, the rule book itself, you know, gives you the detailed rules and it'll walk you through kind of some different uh, scenarios and turns and things. And it gives you different uh, ways to set up your campaign. You can set up subplots and stuff, which I'll get into. Uh, but you're really going to live and breathe out of these reference cards when you look at the different maneuvers that you can do, uh, some of the different stats and things that you can actually uh, you know, help you with the maneuvering and the attacking and everything like that. And finally, the game does come with a handy set of dice as well as some various different components for marking damage and hunting and prey and all that kind of stuff and some other different mechanics. And you get two of these turn dials here, which you'd be using to help maneuver. You will want to supply some kind of measuring device, a tape measure or something like this. Now here you can see it's sort of the point cost for buying some of the different riders. We've got the four Hellion types and the four Reaver types. And you can see the first level is going to be fresh meat experienced. And then you can sort of level them up all the way to arena champion. So when you build your squad, you're going to have to pay the point cost for the level of the rider there, as well as here for the actual you know device that they're on. So a jet bike will be 50. And if you have a Reaver, experience Reaver, that's 55. So that'd be 105 points and that will come with some kind of default weapons and then it gives you some options here to add for a couple more points you can swap out weapons and then down here we can see some of the different weapons and what they can do that gives you the range uh, the kill uh, roll that you need to make to see if you actually kill and just instead of just damaging uh, your target 
and so on. And then some of the weapons have special rules, like you can get caltrops to drop out and stuff. So typically you're gonna build out a 750 point squad. It does give you, give you a couple of starter squads to get you up and running. And then later during the course of the campaign, you're gonna acquire money and you can use money for a few different things. But one thing that you can do is instead of paying like a point cost, as you add new members to your gang, you're gonna pay the equivalent uh, in money to be able to add uh, new bikers and they can level up uh, through the course of playing different scenarios. One thing you'll notice here is once they get down to level four, you will get a skill. And the skills over here, when you, when you acquire a skill, you roll a D6 and then you get a random skill that you can use uh, once uh, per game. And the first thing you're gonna do each game is you're gonna roll off to see who is getting ambushed. Uh, so everybody's just gonna have a roll off and whoever loses it will have to place in the center of the table. Now if you have a mixed pack of Hellions and Reavers, you get a minus one uh, for your roll. If you have fewer models than the opposing pack, you get a plus one to your roll. So you're gonna roll off. And then you have to place your figures here within the center of the table. And you go ahead and mark it with this token here, which also doubles as a caltrops later on in the game. So you'll put this in the middle and everybody has to be six inches from the center. So you find the dead center of the table and let's say the reavers here, uh, you know, they lost. So you kind of put everybody around like that and then you'll have them facing a direction. And then you will randomly roll a die here. So let's roll like that. So we've got a five and we'll take a look at this here. And so the five is on this side of the table there. And so the attacker, We'll then take one of their models, let's just take uh, Macy Gray here, and then we'll stick her on the edge of the table from that side, and then the rest of the models have to be within nine inches of that model that would be touching that proverbial uh, table edge. So they'll be coming at them like this. Now you could be coming at them, you know, dead ahead or straight behind. You typically want to come from the uh, target's rear because it gives you a little bit better of a modifier because you're shooting at them and they can't really react as well. But the person that is getting ambushed here will get an emergency turn. And you're gonna consult this little chart here and you can see the amount that you lost the ambush roll by is the amount that you get to sort of compensate. So think of it that your little group is kind of flying along, maybe they're coming home from the drug deal or a hit or some crime or something, and then these guys see them and they go to ambush them. So they go, they kind of er, record scratch and then they get to turn. So if you only lost by one, you can do a 90 degree turn like that and start to attack. And if you lost by uh, three or more points, you wouldn't get to turn at all. So you would be taken completely by surprise there. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, right out of the gate, everything is mayhem. And then you're gonna go into your first round. Now, one thing that you might try to do here as the attackers try to get in the rear. So let's just pretend that these guys didn't get a chance to, uh, to make an emergency turn. And so we'll just guess that that's about nine inches there. And so he's gonna be, or she's gonna be behind this guy here. So she is within uh, this target's here, rear arc. So you're gonna draw a kind of a 45 degree angle outside of the stem of the base, and then a 45 degree angle out this way. So his front arc is in, her, his rear, rear arc, and you get these tokens here. So every round you're gonna reevaluate that. So you can see we've got A here and A there. So the A of the target here, which is kind of like a bent concave uh, thing there, we'll mark that and then we'll mark her with this. And so now she's kind of like marked that target and she's hunting that target. Now what that means is for the rest of this turn, she's gonna get a bonus modifier when she attacks this, but if she chooses to hunt that, she can't attack anybody else. And so once all players have taken turns choosing uh, who they're gonna hunt if, if possible, and then you're going to move hunters and quarry. So the quarry here is our, all the targets. So all the quarries are gonna move first. So you're gonna take turns moving quarry. Now anytime, uh, let's say my opponent moves the quarry, they're gonna move them and then immediately whoever's hunting them will follow them. So let's say we do a turn here and move this way and maybe we'll turn her a little bit and then move up closer like that. So all the quarry is gonna move and then it's gonna trigger any hunters immediately after. So in a situation like this, let's say she was hunting him but then he was hunting her, this quarry would move and then she would trigger a move and because she moved, then this guy that was hunting her would move. And so you're gonna resolve all of those and then anybody else that's not hunting or whatever, you're gonna take turns then moving the rest of your figures. Now, how does movement work? Well, if we take a look here, the jet bike has a minimum movement of six and a maximum of 18 and the skyboard has a minimum and a maximum of 12. So you always usually have to be moving. Uh, so that's something you gotta keep in mind. Remember I talked about running into terrain and just blowing up. That's something you gotta be keep in mind there. So you're gonna move uh, at least this amount up to that amount and then you can turn before or after you move. So you either turn and then move 
or move and then turn. And you can see the radius here. So 45 degree on the jet bikes and a 60 degree on the skyboard. So you'll take and place this marker here. So you see you got 45 and then 60 for the skyboard. So this is a jet bike. We'll take that there. We can turn 45 up to 45 anyway, and then go move a minimum of six inches. So you're gonna close the gap pretty quickly there. So I'll move her up there. Oh, that's actually a little bit too far. And then, so you're gonna move, and then everybody's gonna do their movement, and then you're gonna do attacks, and then you're gonna roll off and see who does attacks, and then you're gonna attack uh, and, and take turns attacking with each figure. Oops, I almost forgot. You also can do a maneuver. Now you can see there's a list of maneuvers here that both Hellions and Reavers can do. Then you have some Reaver only and some Hellion only. And some of these actually require that you have a specific type of equipment, but it'll tell you inside the, uh, the description there. But let's say you wanted to do a barrel roll. This is bus must be made before moving the model. If successful, the model's minimum movement distance is halved. So you're gonna to try to make an attempt to do all of these maneuvers. And the way that you do that is you're gonna look at the agility and the pilot skill. So let's take a look at, let's say you had an, oops, you had an experienced uh, heli in there and you can take a look at the piloting skill there is three and a skyboard here and they have an agility of eight. So that's a total of 11. Trying to roll low there. So you roll 2d6 and obviously as long as you don't roll a 12, you should be good. You should know that a 12 is also always a failure. If you roll a 12 on a failure, you'll actually take a point of damage. Now every time you take a point of damage, you've got these little damage tokens here, other double-sided one and three. Uh, it's actually going to reduce your agility, so you're gonna get a little bit more shaky, and it's also going to affect the kill rolls, which I'll explain in a minute. So you're gonna roll that, and if you succeed, then you pull off the maneuver. If not, then you fail, and you may end up flying into a spire or a rock or something. Now when you attack, you're also gonna roll 2d6. You're gonna look at the range here, uh, you know, make sure they're within range, and make sure you're in, you're in the right arc. That'll tell you which arc they have to be in, which again, is just a 45 degree angle uh, from the stem there. And then you're gonna roll, and then you have to try to eat the agility. So in this case, you wanna roll high, and double ones are an automatic miss, and double sixes are an automatic hit. If you beat their agility, then you're going to target and see if you get a kill. So here you have the kill plus, and so the different weapons have different uh, you know, abilities to instantly kill. And if you do roll 2d6 and you're trying to beat that amount there, and that will just be an instant kill if you do that. If not, then you'll do a damage. And some of the weapons have different effects and things as well. There are tokens here to mark you know, that you've attacked, so we know that she's attacked for this turn. Sometimes you can get stunned, and so you'll flip those over and that'll show that the target's been stunned. These is sort of like temporary damage because these are going to reduce your agility by one, but they're going to go away at the end of the round. And like I said before, each damage is going to reduce your agility, but it's also going to affect the kill rolls against you. Effectively, you're going to add one for each damage to any die roll that's made against you on a kill roll. And if you attack one of these Hellions, you're going to get plus one against uh, the Hellion there because they're a little bit easier to kill because they're kind of standing uh, you know, out there in the open. Is a concept of cover, so if any part of the model is obscured from your line of sight, so let's just move that there and say she's down here like that, so maybe he's he's flying around that, then this is actually, you're gonna allow to get a cover save. So she's gonna attack that, she can maybe only see the front of it, and the target's just gonna simply roll, uh, basically flip a coin. Uh, if it's four or higher, then you uh, make a save. Last thing you can do is jink. So the way that jink works is let's say she was attacking him like this and maybe he's already got like a damage on him and stuff so he doesn't want to get hit too bad. So you can choose to jink here and you'll just go ahead and put that little jink marker like that. And so instead of just the agility that the attacker has to beat on this, you're going to add the pilot value to that agility so it makes it a little bit more difficult to attack. But this model here is no longer allowed to do an attack or a maneuver for uh, the rest of the round. In the game in one of two ways, either A, just wiping out all of your opponent's uh, vehicles, or once you lose a third or more of your models, then you have to start rolling to see if you break and basically panic and the rest of everybody runs away. So once you roll, uh, let's say we had four jet bikes out here and then we lost the, the two here, so then we would be at a third or more, and then you would roll a die, if it's less than or equal to the number of models that you've lost, then you break. So it is possible to actually have both sides break uh, at the end of the same round, and if they both do, they both kind of bug out, and then it's just a draw. So we would roll that there, and then, then the game would be over.
important thing to note about the campaigns is at, once you get your initial murder pack up, you'll start to acquire more figures. And then you're going to actually sort of divide your forces up into different murder packs. So let's just for fun say we had these three Hellions and then two jet bikes, and that was a murder pack there. And then our other murder pack was a similar build. And then you'll randomly choose which one you're going to use. So you have to kind of divide your forces up, keep them a little bit balanced. You don't want to put all of your good figures in one force because you might roll and then have to take your crappy force. <laughs> so you got to balance them out. And then the other murder pack that's not chosen is, is effectively going away and doing another mission where they don't get ambushed and they collect money. So for the more murder packs that you're able to divvy up, uh, the more money you can you can do. So you could even, if you wanted to get real frisky with it, you could take one guy out and say, okay, I'm gonna take sort of a lower force. I'm gonna get a little bit of a buff on my roll to see if I get ambushed, because remember you get plus one, and this guy's gonna be off maybe on a little solo mission, getting me a hundred bucks. Uh, so that's an interesting way to kind of divide your forces up. And then you're gonna take a look here at the type of fight. So you're gonna roll this before the fight, and this is gonna have some modifiers here, um, extra money, you might get extra victory points and so on. And then you're also gonna have subplots and each team is gonna roll off on this separately. And this is very interesting. Some of these, one of these I didn't really, I thought was kind of dumb, but now that I've played it, I'm like, oh, this would actually make the game really interesting. So for example, you'll roll on this and let's say you get low fuel. Well, this says the player that rolls this result must roll a die at the end of each round. If the score is less than a number, excuse me, less than the round number, then the murder pack breaks and the fight is over. So they've run solo and feel that they have to head home. So you could effectively have the game over uh, right in the second round because, you know, maybe you roll a one and then so you fled home. So that makes you really have to uh, push and really be very aggressive in terms of who you're trying to attack because you want to get it to the point where, you know, your opponent is trying to break and stuff. And so these are going to kind of just change up the game a little bit here with these subplots and give you sort of, not really different objective, but just different approaches and attitudes towards the game. And then after the fight, you're going to roll a d6 to see if anybody's injured. If you roll a one, they're killed. Two and three, they have to miss the next fight. Four to six, they're fine. Interestingly enough, the experience, you get to choose one of your guys to get a, one experience point and you choose one of your opponents and they get to do the same and then you get a victory point and then you get 100 income for each murder pack that you created before the fight. So in this previous example, I created two, so I would get 200 bucks, one for the one I took and then one for the one that I broke off. And so you'll have extra money here uh, to deal with. And so you can play that campaign you know, up to like 10 victory points or whatever you want to do. And then the last thing you do here are these deals, and this is one way to spend money. You'll roll 3d6, and you get to do each of these deals for each die that you roll. So let's just say I rolled this, and so I got a 6, a 4, and a 4. So I could take this deal twice and this deal once, and then this one allows you to get drugs, which you can see on the chart here, and this allows you to get extra little bonuses and enhancements. And so I could do this target lock. Um, deal twice but it costs you money to do them and these are ways to kind of modify your vehicles and things like that and then last thing here is you can then get new recruits uh re-equip weapons and stuff and that's just going to cost you whatever it is in points it's going to cost you that much money to do that and you can spend a hundred bucks to level up a fighter so maybe you got an experience on her here and then you wanted him, and then you wanted this other guy to level up, so you had an extra 100 bucks, so you maybe you would level him up there. Uh, and then there's a way, if you choose not to do a, uh, a normal fight, you can do a Sky War and everybody brings their models. It's basically the same game, and maybe you wanna increase the table size there. Okay, so that's Gangs of Kimura. Now, what do I think of it? Well, I've been having a ton of fun with this game. And so the first thing that I just love about this game is the setup of the scenario, where you have one person just kind of flying along, they're kind of doing their own thing, you know, maybe they did some crime or they pulled off some heist, and they're just cruising along trying to get back to their headquarters, and then boom, a rival gang shows up and you get ambushed, and things are just like, you know, in motion right as the game moves along. And so right from there, it's just, it's very kind of frantic, fast paced, hectic, you know, it's a little bit chaotic and you're really just trying not to run into stuff and you're trying to get yourself into a position. And so the bikes and, and, and the flyers, they make it seem uh, really sort of uh, out of control. So you can really feel it like you're kind of like banking and you're trying to pull off these maneuvers and get in a good position and not just get blown out of the sky. 
And so you can just kind of picture that these kind of bikes just whizzing around in the sky above this town, or in this case, in this forest, um, you know, and trying their best not to get, get blown out of the sky. So that whole vibe of it just really comes across very, very well. Now, I think some folks will probably have issue with a little bit of sort of the randomness of some of the things, like I talked about, like the low fuel thing, uh, that could be a little bit off-putting, and the kind of like the rolling for braking on your turn, because the, the game can only last like two, three rounds, uh, possible. I haven't had anything that lasts two rounds, but we had a three round game and then we had, uh, I think two five round games. And from the beginning, you're at the seat of your pants and you've got to be ready to like lose right away. And so the games are very quick. They take like 30 minutes or so once you kind of get the hang of, you know, what all the stuff does. Uh, but, which is really cool because it's, you know, there's a lot of these kind of campaign games like a Blood Bowl is a game and, you know, like a Dead Zone and there's all these different campaign games that are coming out now. But this is a very quick, almost like a filler campaign game and it has all those, you know, nice, cool, funny uh, narrative things that are kind of bolted onto it uh, that make it. Uh, quick and refreshing. It's not like a, it's not like a, uh, a commitment or a chore to have to sit down and play a game of this, which is pretty cool. But you still get that kind of fun flavor of these dastardly gangs just kind of cruising around. So it really works for that. Uh, you know, the maneuvering and just the fact that you like you have to move a certain amount and or you know you, you don't want to really move that far, but you've got to make a test to see if you can throw on your brakes. Uh, one of the uh, the bikes has the air brake on it that you can just really you know put your movement to zero but it's not a guarantee uh, so all that stuff really works well the other thing that like i mentioned sort of a disappointment is the terrain but i don't know that one's fine you, it gets you up and playing the game you can go make your own terrain and set up your different environments as you want i just kind of wish there was a little bit more variety to that but other than that, I mean, the models are great, and you know the cardboard chits they come with are, are they're not flimsy. You know, sometimes uh, some of these games that are miniature games, they don't really commit to the other part of the components, but they did a good job here. And the uh, the rules and everything are, are really outlined nicely. I will say one thing that we kind of struggled with, just sort of as a warning, is some of the, like I would call the rules are actually on the reference card because I was like, well. How do you, uh, what was I trying to figure out? Something about the skills or something. And I was like, oh yeah, how do I upgrade to that thing? And I was like, oh, okay, the rule for that's on the card. It wasn't mentioned anywhere in the book. So if you have a question about something, I would certainly read through the quick reference, but it's there, so it's no big deal. Oh, and the game even comes with this, uh, this, this thing here. It's like a little two page thing. And this is like the rules of the game. It's like, here's how you move, here's how you attack, here's what you're looking for. So you could just throw some models down and just start playing out of that. Uh, so yeah, I hope that they, maybe expand this at some point. Uh, I, what I would think is I think if you really get into the game and like it, I would say each person that was going to play it should just get a box of their own. And then you've got way enough uh, of these uh, fighters to uh, go through a long campaign or a somewhat long campaign because you've got six of the Reavers and then 10 of the Hellions. And so you could certainly split the box with somebody and one person plays Reavers and the other plays Hellions. You could go through a couple of, of you know, games in the campaign, uh, but then you could start to mix them and add in and really kind of play with both sides. And I think you'd be set, you know, and you could play it for months and, you know, play a weekly campaign or something with it. So I really recommend it. There's a, some of the kind of the end game stuff. You got to like just know going in that you might have a quick game where it's like, oh, well, that game was over in 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but then you can just play it again. It doesn't take any time to set it up. You just pick up your models and put them back down and roll off and you're off you go again. Uh, but I, it's really fun. It's, it's very much like, I know I've said this already, but I'm trying to express the, like just the seat of your pants feel. Uh, it's been a while that I played a game where right when we sat down, like the hairs of my arms started standing up and I was like, oh wow, you know, there's all these different kind of things that are just happening, like right on the first turn. There's no like, you know, a lot of these miniature games, even with like X-Wing and stuff, it's like, okay, I'm gonna move forward a little bit. You know, I don't wanna get flanked over here. And, you know, this one's just like, I'm flanked <laughs> right at the beginning. And then, holy cow, I've gotta try to burn away and, you know, go around these different uh, pylons or spires or whatever you've got laid out on the, on the battlefield. So definitely give this one a look. It's a relatively uh, cheap MSRP for this. And uh, anyway, I was pretty surprised how much I like this. So take a look at it. Thanks.